Our next presenter, um, Patrick Daggett, is the leader of the Innovation Lab at Thinking Box, um, where he continuously pushes the boundaries at that intersection of art and technology and storytelling, where I think a lot of us uh, sort of live in that space. Um, Patrick, uh, Patrick's vibrant energy and experience and creativity really enables him to create uh, things that people take selfies in front of um, that really captivates and engages audiences. Um, throughout his career, he has worked very extensively as a freelance creative coder, designer, developer, uh, editor, and animator for television stations, advertising agencies, numerous uh, independent creatives. So please join me in welcoming Patrick Daggett. Hi, thanks so much for having me. I just wanted to start by saying it's a, it's a pleasure to be here and be uh, hosted by you guys and to have Thinking Box uh, make the time for me to be here. So this has been great. Um, yeah, so this is the Creative Technologist Playground, uh, unleashing experiential magic and transforming creativity with AI. We're gonna, first I'm gonna introduce myself. We're gonna talk maybe a little bit about what creative technology is, and then we're gonna look at several ways in which AI is gonna help creative technologists uh, create experiences that are, are magical and captivating, which is the goal for all of us who work in the field. I'd be remiss not to start by mentioning Thinking Box. Uh, we're a creative collective shaping the future through of uh, brands through craft and curiosity. Uh, I work on the uh, digital production side of things, uh, working mostly in experiential. Uh, and then just recently, I like mentioned before, uh, I'm leading the innovations lab. Um, so just a little bit about myself. Uh, I started uh, with an education in broadcast and, and then got my master's in digital media, kind of learned more of the technical side and how to how to program. Um, uh, and then I was immediately brought into the art world and started working kind of as a studio assistant for established new media artists. Uh, I developed and installed new works into uh, art galleries, giving me a practical knowledge of installation into the galleries, as well as it introduced me into OpenGL shaders, generative animation, and projection in general, uh, and then eventually into projection mapping. Uh, it also kind of like launched my own personal artistic practice, and I've been able to have interactive exhibitions in Europe, here in Toronto at Nuit Blanche, uh, and all across the US. My work usually centers uh, around computer vision and real-time graphics. Uh, I also enjoy you know, implicating the user in the creation process, which lends itself to my professional work as well, because we're always trying to get participants to like make media uh, inside of these installations. Um, I initially started my career, uh, professional career as a motion graphics designer and a VJ. Uh, and that led me towards projection mapping, uh, which I worked uh, on a freelance basis across North America for a few years. Now that I'm at Thinking Box, uh, I work predominantly on experiential activations kind of all over the world, uh, serving brands and artists that seek to make a lasting impact. Um, my role at the Innovations Lab is to experiment with new technology uh, that best and see how it best fits uh, our existing practices uh, and processes uh, and how we can innovate uh, with new uses of technology around the studio and into our pitches. A little sample of my work here. Uh, we do everything from, you know, interactive basketball floors and video games, smart fridges, or even this one on the bottom left I wanted to include because it's so funny. Uh, it was during covid and they had uh, a drive-in movie theater and we were responsible for spraying blood all over people uh, at a particularly gory moment in that, <laughs> in that uh, piece. Uh, and here's a little sample of some of my artistic work. So uh, usually I'm implicating the users into creating things using a mixture of technology and kind of repurposing it uh, in a way that uh, people may not have uh, previously uh, have expected the technology to be used. And I mean, obviously the goal with all of that being said, and the goal of creative technologists is we're always looking to, you know, uh, share a poem, not necessarily a tech demo. So we need to, you know, find solutions to tell these stories using technology, uh, but then also see how they fold into um, natural expectations of people uh, in the real world uh, and not really force the technology, let's say. Um, then the second job of a creative technologist is to actually create it. So there's a very hands-on um, process when we're creating these projects. We're physically building them, we're developing them and testing them and trying to 
find the edge cases to build something that's really robust. Uh, this is you know, true for anyone working in immersive experiences as well as in the art world. Uh, and then the last thing that we hopefully all do, whether it's on the side or, or part of our roles, is that we explore new tech and try and find use cases that are maybe a bit outside the box for that tech. And that's something that is closer to the art side. I think that artists are very good at um, you know, co-opting technologies and trying to use them in new ways that ask spe uh, specific questions about how these technologies integrate into the natural world. Uh, creative technology is kind of like mixing oil and water. I feel like sometimes these two worlds kind of live separately, but as a creative technologist, we find the balance of where our uh, creative lenses are appropriate and when our technological um, you know, expertise is needed. I personally find that people hire me to be a technologist and the creativity is on the afterthought. Um, but hopefully it's still an asset to people when they hire a creative technologist to have someone who has a bit of a creative mind. I hope that AI will aid us in our roles by enhancing the amount of interactivity that we can put into our projects and improve the output of users' creations, making them more personal and more breathtaking. AI should also allow eventually creative technologists to concentrate less on the simple technicalities of a system and more on the conception and architecture and building valid prototypes. <clears throat> so now that we have talked about who I am, what creative technology is, I think everyone here is really here to hear about how AI can work its way uh, into a creative technologist workflow. So let's start by taking a look at some of the traditional tools that are used in creative technology and, uh, and see maybe uh, some of the problems that are pretty common uh, with these uh, strategies and tools uh, some of the improvements that have recently happened in AI and how uh, those improvements are manifesting themselves into actual products that can solve these problems. Um, <clears throat> I want to start with a quote. So we're stuck with technology when what we really want is just stuff that works. Douglas Adams wrote uh, The Ga uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. He's a British artist known for his uh, satire and wit. Uh, the context of the quote can be understood in the context of his whole body of work, which often talks about frustrations that arise um, when humans uh, are, you know, frustrated with the complexities uh, of technology. We surround ourselves with various gadgets and devices uh, that promise more convenience and efficiency. However, the reality is that technology never lives up to this promise and leads to more frustrations. Um, what people want is simply something that works without the glitches and uh, technical details. So as creative technologists, I think that's a common challenge for us is to make the barrier to entry into our works as low as possible and make the interaction you know, very natural. Uh, and hopefully AI will take a lot of these complexities out and deal with them in the background. In, in general, uh, the common challenges with all of the tech that a creative tech um, uses from day to day, but boil down to questions of accuracy, responsiveness, and adaptability. The sensors we use are good within a specific scope, but when you ask them to deal with something that's novel um, or maybe something that's in a different condition in which the system was built, uh, a lot of our common strategies for object detection and motion tracking, even sensors for creative electronics, uh, break down under these extreme conditions. We will go into specific examples for all of this, but in general, I think that, um, you know, we'll see quite soon uh, advancements in faster processing, allowing AI algorithms uh, to uh, optimize for efficient computations on specialized hardware like GPUs and TPUs, which are tensor processing units. Uh, these are very small and working their way into electronics as we speak, and they'll allow people to run these AI algorithms on uh, you know, uh, edge devices in the field instead of uh, having them out on the cloud and having to bring them all back. This faster processing will allow us to use large amounts of data and enable real-time or near real-time analysis and decision-making from AI. Uh, we also have uh, parallel processing on modern hardware architectures. This allows multiple computations to be performed simultaneously more than ever before. And this will result in faster inference times and improved responsiveness for real-time applications. 
We've seen a large expansion of predictive models. AI is able to make predictions based on historical data and even capture data in real time to use it in the future. This enables proactive responses, which can reduce latency in real time systems. Uh, and we'll see our small, small computers that, you know, for a creative technologists, they might be fitting it inside of a little booth or something be able to do much more computation than even some of the larger computers that we have in our office today. That being said, another improvement we're gonna see is on device processing. AI models uh, can be deployed, like I said, directly on edge devices, um, and we'll have them very, very portable. We can take them anywhere we want. Um, let's move on to some specifics here. So a lot of my work uses computer vision. Computer vision has some obvious limitations, right? There can be challenges for uh, accurate object detection, lighting conditions such as low light, dramatic lighting or odd shadows, strange object appearances like being printed on a t-shirt, illustrated or maybe a knitted object, scale issues or distortions, even occlusions can uh, completely throw off an object recognition system. These object recognition systems have very specific training as well which leads to them per to perform poorly on novel or unseen examples. If I'm training a model to recognize fruit and I show it a durian, and it's never been shown a durian, traditionally these object recognition libraries have a very set dictionary of objects that they can uh, detect. And, um, and it, the time consuming manual data annotation of said um, models uh, really restricts these models from uh, detecting things that they haven't been specifically trained on. There's been improvements in computer vision. Uh, the increased data availability allows the, you know, for better training of the models and something called zero shot learning where it learns rules in the abstract about certain objects allow for modern computer vision models to actually detect new objects that they haven't even seen. Um, Clip is really interesting. It's basically just a model where you can show it a picture and it'll tell you about everything inside of the picture. Um, our old strategy as creative technologists for this type of thing was something called YOLO. And YOLO has like a dictionary of maybe like 20 or 30 objects that they can recognize um, where Clip has been trained um, with, um, what is it called? Let me look at my notes here. Uh, reinforced learning, which allows them to gamify the detection process uh, when training the model. And it's led to uh, a model that can actually detect all images inside uh, of an, uh, or all objects inside of an image, uh, whether it's been trained on them and, or not. So where something like YOLO is very fast and at the moment is the best model to use for real-time object detection. Things like Clip uh, actually expand that and uh, allow us to get way more accurate results. Uh, now, things like Clip and Segment Anything, which is an extension of Clip that allow you to draw masks around these objects that have been detected, uh, are can now be embedded directly onto hardware like the Oak D camera. The Oak D camera, which you can see at the top of the slide, uh, has an embedded TPU where you can actually load uh, computer vision models directly onto the webcam. And just by connecting it via USB, which you would do odd, always anyways with a webcam, you can return the results of the computer vision model directly over something like OSC into your system. So now you could take something like this, hook it up to a very low powered computer, uh, like a Raspberry Pi and run uh, you know, a full robust computer vision installation with just the hardware directly embedded into the camera. Uh, this is a great example. We used this, uh, this spring, we had a conference at South by Southwest and we built this project called the Alter. Uh, you could put any object inside of the bowl. It would take a picture of it. We'd use Clip to get a very detailed uh, description of what the object was, what kind of textures were in it, maybe even if it had a resemblance to a specific artistic style. And then we use stable diffusion with the control net model in order to force the image to render in the specific shape of our logo. We've all seen the Nike ads with like the top down um, landscape photography that is the Nike logo. This is essentially the same process, except we've layered clip on top of it to make it more interactive. Uh, so that users could put anything inside of the bowl. <clears throat> when it comes to creative electronics, lots of the limitations are, you know, there's noise, floating calibrations, and environmental anomalies. 
Soon we'll have AI powered signal processing that can help distinguish sig signals from noise. And these will be embedded directly onto the hardware. The, these AI algorithms will also be able to continuously monitor the sensor's outputs and compare them with reference values to maintain accuracy and detect anomalies uh, and, and um, you know, filter them out. The picture on the top of this slide is a project from Benjamin Kabe. It's called AI Nose. And the reason I put it in here is because a lot of what we're gonna see with hardware sensors and AI has to do with sensor fusion. A lot of creative technology uses sensors, but they use the sensors in a silo. They just get the data directly from the sensor and they're not using data from multiple sensors simultaneously. Um, we can use uh, AI to build models that have been trained on multiple sensors data simultaneously. This combination of the data linked to a time code allows these models to detect things that a single um, sensor would not be able to detect. Benjamin Kabe's AI nose combines two gas sensors and a temperature sensor to make an artificial nose. This Arduino project can classify various types of hard liquor, coffee, and other strong smelling liquids with an extreme amount of accuracy that would not be possible without the developments in sensor fusion that are powered with AI. At the bottom here, I just wanted to have a shout out to the Nano 33 BLE Sense. This is a great board that can run TensorFlow Lite. You can load your own models onto it. Uh, you can even train them directly from it. It's also a great little board if you want to add these sensors to your project on a Raspberry Pi or any other computer. You could just plug it in over USB. The board is battery powered. It can detect color, brightness, proximity, gesture. It has a digital microphone, a motion sensor, vibration and orientation sensor, temperature, humidity, and pressure sensor. This thing is awesome if you're ever thinking about a sensor fusion type of solution for your creative technology projects. Oh man, my time is flying here. I have no time to talk to you guys. Um, there's some um, improvements in motion capture. Uh, you know, some of the limitations for motion capture were that, you know, you had a very specialized amount of hardware. There was processing time to get the data out of it. And there were also budget limitations. The stuff is super expensive. Um, with improvements in this noise reduction, like I was talking about, as well as some improvements in detecting certain amounts of poses and being to extrapolate where bodies are moving as, the, as they're being occluded or moving through a space has really allowed us to move the field of object detection, sorry, of motion capture forward in a way that completely eliminates the need for all of this uh, specialized hardware. NVIDIA has a, a model called vid to vid Cameo I'd recommend watching it. It basically shows how they can use AI uh, to detect points on the face and do a complete motion capture uh, without any need for specialized hardware or exposure, expensive motion capture setups. Move AI is the technology at the top and it's the same uh, type of idea, except it can do the full body. Uh, it uses open pose technology and a proprietary technology called Disguise. Uh, it can be used to do motion capture, but it also has a real-time element. So if you're looking to do full-body real-time motion capture, that's definitely the way to go. I am just going to power through. Here are some new sensors and inputs for uh, these systems that uh, we'll be able to use now that basically allow for new methods of input into creative technology systems that we didn't have before. Here's our quote. <laughs> I'm just skipping it. We have large language models. Stuff like ChatGPT is amazing. Um, these allow people to use natural language as their input into the system. Uh, this used to be super limited in creative technology. And now people can say kind of like whatever they want. And it gets translated into data that we can use as a specific input into the system. This is amazing. People can even use other languages. It really uh, enhances the accessibility uh, of our projects. Uh, it's also able to produce uh, subjective responses. You can see in the GIF above, someone types in, take me to the prettiest city in Rome. The system is able to come up with a, subject a subjective response of it being Rome and take them there, even though the input was kind of vague. And this is super powerful for building interactive systems. And then the last thing I want to say about building interactive systems with large language models is everyone who's at all interested in building systems with large language models should check out LangChain. 
Langchain is an open source library that provides developers with the necessary tools to create applications with large language models. You can build chains of commands, you can have it access private data, or even have it take on a specific personality when it's responding to people. This is a great way of limiting the scope, but adding specific domain knowledge into a large language model. Uh, synthesized media will be a huge new type of input. I mean, uh, at its very surface, we have things like stable diffusion. Uh, I know Adobe sponsoring it. Firefly is great. Uh, automatic 1111 is the open source uh, alternative. Gives you things like loading uh, custom models, things called LORAs, which are specific plugins to render a specific person right into the model that it may not know of, uh, as well as tools to do video. Uh, even text to 3D is starting to come out of these diffusion models. And this will allow people to make assets for their games and for their interactive experiences with a, with a much lower barrier to entry than it would have been to having to hire freelancers to do all this stuff just to get your prototype out. So it's a really amazing time. Uh, there's also going to be new stories from familiar voices, projects like Nothing Forever, Drake's album Winter is Cold, or even the new South Park uh, showrunner called Show One are all able to create media um, out of thin air, essentially, just using the data from the past episodes of, of this stuff. And then the, the third thing about synthesized media is we're going to have the ability to use AI to do reconstructions of media into new forms. Things like deep fakes or voice synthesis obviously are very low-hanging fruit and super impressive right now, but I think we're also going to see um, advancements in uh, using AI for video compression. Uh, it's been proven that we can use AI to create video compression that has 10 times less bandwidth uh, needs than even H.264. Uh, this real ESR GAN is another model that can be used to restore old SD material. So we'll see HD versions of stuff that we only have masters of on VHS, which is gonna be really cool. Uh, we have real-time gaze detection and being able to like turn people. So in a real-time sense, you might have someone in a photo booth that's not quite looking where they're supposed to be. And we'll be able to adjust that with AI uh, using the NVIDIA suite. I think you can already do that. And then obviously targeted rendering is huge for advertising. So we'll be able to build LoRa's for a specific product. Let's say it's a backpack or a specific brand of car. And then depending on where you're looking at the advertisement, it'll be able to be rendered into a context that makes sense to you where you're looking at the advertisements, which is which is very cool. The next thing that I want to talk about is we have gesture control. I know I'm over time. I'm going to try and go as fast as I can. Uh, but basically, these little uh, Arduinos um, and uh, in a process much like sensor fusion, uh, we can take specific linear data um, and make a recur a recurrent neural network and they're well suited for sequential data where the order of the input matters. In the case of multiple channels, RNNs can be used uh, to model temporal differences uh, and dependencies and capture patterns across different time steps for each channel. This allows us to do things like capture the shape of a wand moving or in real time read and reenact American Sign Language, uh, facial gestures or other accessibility focused input methods. I really think that gesture control is going to come a long way with AI quite soon. And the last thing I wanted to show was just how we can personalize these experiences. You know, we don't need a very much uh, a lot of data in order to do something like a deep fake now. Uh, voice synthesis is about three seconds of voice data, and deep fakes can be done with a single image. With this low barrier to entry, it's going to be really easily easy to make someone the star of the performance or have interactions with people that they might know. Um, voice synthesis uh, tech to take a look at, obviously, is Eleven Labs. They're really good. Uh, and voice.ai has a real-time voice changer that is very, very impressive. Um, yeah. And then I was just going to highlight a few pieces of art that use AI and close it up. So we should be done here in a sec. Rafik Anadol is unsupervised. Basically takes all of the modern art at the MoMA in NYC, uh, takes a big database of it, and... Um, and makes and combines it so that we know which projects are related to each other. His pieces explore uh, generated artworks that live in the negative space between existing artworks. So instead of using AI to create a copy of someone's artwork, he's using AI to explore artwork that hasn't existed before. And I think that that's really interesting. He also gives these all the way as NFTs when you go and take a look at it. It's pretty neat. 
This is a, a project called Paragraphica by Bjorn Carmen, and he's basically using um, GPS data uh, in order to fill out a Mad Libs description of the area where the picture was taken. And then he synthesizes these photos based on just the GPS data. And it's really interesting because it, it questions, you know, the role of AI in creativity. The artwork really raises questions uh, about the creative process and explores tension between traditional artistic methods and the technology driven innovations that we seek to find as creative technologists. And the last one I wanted to just show you is called Behold These Glorious Times by Trevor Paglin. And it delves into the world of artificial intelligence and kind of highlights how these computers are learning how to see. It takes two different feeds of images, very personal photos and videos that have somehow found their way into these databases used to train computer vision. And then the second set of videos explores how the computer breaks it down into edges and patterns and tries to learn what we are as a species in a computational way. It's interesting because you start seeing things being categorized that are completely false. Like this guy on the top left doesn't look like a sheep to me, but for some reason, the system thinks that it is. It, it really poses questions about, yes, these labels seem to be accurate, but when they're not accurate, how are those mislabeled people and objects um, being affected by the political side of all of this training? And really, how are we to, to train fairly? I know I raced through a bunch of that stuff because I'm going long, uh, but I just wanted to say that, you know, Interpol reported that by 2026, 90% of online media will be generated in AI by some way. We have a unique situation as creative techs uh, because we have first access to these tools. I really hope that this will push us more towards uh, the roles of creative directors and we'll be able to, um, you know, collaborate at a higher level uh, using these tools and just create better work. Uh, I'm so sorry that I've been speaking so fast. I saw myself go over 30 minutes and I've just been like racing. So maybe I'll just open it up for questions and anything that I've skipped over, or I was vague about, let's, let's chat about it. All right. Thanks, Patrick. You actually have a, a couple more minutes. <laughs> so oh, really? You're, yeah, you're all good. You're good. But we're, we're, we're right on time. So oh, okay, um, th wow, that was great. Very dense. I know. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. No. So so much there. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, we do have some questions. I'm gonna uh, dive in and uh, see what we've got going. Please do post uh, any questions that you have. I realize it was a lot going on there. So, um, but please do post any questions that you have for Patrick in the chat. I'm just diving in there, and and we'll start with the first question. Um, I, I think this is a great question, and it's a very big one. How can uh, creative technologists like yourself strike a balance between leveraging a AI technologies, but also maintaining their kind of unique artistic vision in these immersive experiences and art installations? Like how do, how do you not get just very, I guess, lost in the, almost the enormity of this technology? Right. I think at its core, when we talk about the artistic side, art has always been, I think, in my opinion, about getting what's in here, out here, in my hands. And there is an enormity to it, right? Like you could have anything, especially when we're talking about something like stable diffusion. So I think, you know, really taking pride in the process of prompting and making your prompts like more than just like, draw me a house on the street having the ability to curate and having taste going forwards will be the thing that people look for when they're hiring a person over AI. So our ability to pare down from the enormity is what will set us apart in the future when these tools are uh, everywhere. Um, I also think that there's some really cool stuff that artists should look at with Stable Diffusion. I mentioned Laura's briefly. Laura's initially were like, you know, I need to like draw Patrick in Stable Diffusion. How do I do it? And then they would train a Laura on me. And then in the prompt, they would say, draw Patrick. And as long as the Laura file is there, it would know how to draw me. But the use case for Laura's is actually much bigger. You can train a Laura on an object. You can train it on an artistic style. Hmm. And I would actually recommend that 
people who have a distinctive artistic style that they want to maintain, if they're not seeing it represented in the models and they would like to, train Alora on your artwork because that will allow you to render things in your style. Um, there's a great illustrator. He, I forget his name, but he did all of the illustrations for a board game called Dungeons and Degenerates. This illustrator uh, suffered um, an injury that made it impossible for him to draw anymore. And they had trained Laura on his artistic style and he was able to complete the series of games just using Stable Diffusion. And it was all within his style. So I think there's a lot of promise there to, to for artists to be able to have these private files that they can plug into pu public models to express their own style by using new technology. Um, yeah, I mean, again, there's there's so much there. Um, we we did have uh, the first presentation today was all about prompts, and I and I I think that's a really good inroad is just getting comfortable with uh, writing prompts. Um, uh, I think a lot of artists, especially those that come from more traditional uh, fields are a little bit intimidated um, uh, by the technology. So uh, I have a question here from Leslie is asking, um, uh, as a student, what do you recommend uh, that they should focus their learning on? Again, it can be very overwhelming. So where where do we start? I think right now the low hanging fruit and the two like most powerful tools that we have in our hands today are uh, large language models and stable diffusion. We're, it depends on what kind of work you wanna make, but if it's based on the written word or on storytelling, I think large language models have a, like a lot of different use cases, especially with something like LangChain. But stable diffusion, I mean, the development of that has just skyrocketed this year. I would definitely, you know, get a, a nice graphics card and just start goofing around with that. I think that has like very immediate results. Also, like, you know, just being able to train additions onto all of that stuff, being able to add your own domain knowledge into an LLM so that they know about private data or being able to add your own image or uh, different plugins for stable diffusion so you can express a style that no one else has. These are small skills that can be added on top of something that you're going to learn anyways that will make a huge impact in differentiating yourself in the ocean of content that we're about to be swimming through. Yeah, I, I really um, I really appreciated that. The very last examples you were showing there it was almost... Um... It's almost like you're you the AI becomes material in mm -hmm. in the art. You know, if you think about art, is often about manipulating materials, right? And and getting good at at a particular sort of material manipulation. And I think creative technologists we've often kind of manipulated code. Um, uh, but I love those last examples of just sort of taking a, a bit of a critical perspective on the AI as material itself. Um, and I have a question here from from uh, Kirsten, who's asking, what are your thoughts about the importance of critical thinking applied to those outputs? Because as an artist, you're you're naturally a, a cultural critic. So is mm -hmm. there a danger for like the lay person or the kind of casual observer to be too uncritical or be, too gullible to sort of accept what they're seeing without realizing that there, there's a critical perspective being taken on the outputs. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's a hard question to ask because it's all about the context of it, right? Yeah. If I'm building a project for, I don't know, a credit card company, like the context doesn't really, or the critical part doesn't matter as long as it's like flashy and it makes people smile. But when we're making art, I think, you know, that critical side is super important for anything that's not a technical feat. Painting was a technical feat until after the Renaissance. And then at that point, it became all about the critical theory and, and the idea behind it, right? So, you know, to the layman, you always have this, you know, you bring your uncle to the art gallery. He's like, I could paint that painting. Um, that's a question of, you know, of, of the ideas behind it. AI is not going to do that. The, that critical step is missing, right? I mean, you could ask ChatGPT to write something about your painting or whatever, but the reason that my uncle isn't hung in the MoMA 
is because there's no critical theory behind his red painting, right? Yeah. So I think that artists have, you know, maybe even more of a duty to bring that to their work than they ever have before. Uh, I think it'll become more important because there's about to be just so much work made with this stuff that that critical element will be what makes it interesting. It'll be the only thing that makes it interesting. Yeah. Um, uh, there's another a comment. It's kind of a comment question. It's uh, just in the chat, but I, I think it's really an interesting uh, point. Um, uh, Rachel is just uh, saying, you know, can we talk a little bit about um, how AI might allow us uh, to hear from new voices? So um, what, what might be the tools here where... Um, art becomes more accessible to people who weren't previously perhaps physically capable right. of, of creating this, this kind of art. Yeah. I mean, I think that I'd like to think that the barriers were pretty low before, but when you actually break it down, like, yeah, maybe there are certain barriers to people being able to express what's in here in here. Um, I think that the barriers will be lower and we will see from uh, input from many people, like the, what I was talking about, about using gestures as inputs, opens up a whole array of opportunities for people with disabilities. Even uh, just being able to uh, express an interest or a position of a pointer using your mind. Like this thing about sensor fusion is not just single sensors. You can put an EKG on someone and be recognizing and triggering gestures with patterns in your brain waves. Like fully paralyzed people might be able to paint paintings mm -hmm. um, or like uh, my children. I love doing this. I get them to draw stuff, just really rough drawings um, on in black and white on paper. They, they tell me what it is. And then I use stable diffusion and I can like be, make it photorealistic, photorealistic for them. And they get yeah. to see it like and that's so inspiring. Then they're drawing all over the place. So I hope that it it has a positive impact on the amount of creation. And I think it's a beautiful idea that, yeah, we will. We'll see more voices and a more diverse uh, set of voices through the use of these tools. Because you don't have to go to, you know, night school and, and draw nudes all night to be good at drawing anymore. Um, good at drawing. To produce an image that has a drawing on it, I should say. I don't want to offend anyone. Um, but, you know those traditional skills will still go very, very far. I always lean on an illustrator at work to help me come up with some sketches before I feed them into stable diffusion. Cause like drawing is still a huge thing. There are certain models that you can plug in to control net in stable diffusion that only run off of drawings. And the better your drawing is, the better the output of the image is. So I think that these core drawing skills will still be very important, at least right now with the current way that the tools work. Yeah, but it's interesting. I think I, I really agree with you. I think that there's there's a lot of potential there for um, people who, who weren't good at drawing to now perhaps be able to t unlock their uh, conceptual artistic potential um, that they might have been hesitant to to attempt. Right. A um, couple of questions here. This is a, a a big question, I would say, from Ken. Uh, as creators, um, consent, uh, credit, compensation being connected to raw data in those training models are really important topics that we haven't really found sort of satisfying resolutions in this current kind of AI gold rush. Um, how do you anticipate these issues being addressed as this technology evolves? I think that there will be technological advancements where these models and as they're being trained will have attribution embedded into them. Uh, I think it's now possible, but maybe it's been designed in a way where that's been ignored, but it is possible to say, you know, we used 0.76% of your artistic style in this image and have that actually embedded in the file. So um, Facebook and Microsoft and a few other companies now, I forget the acronym, but they're coming up with a basically a digital stamp that they embed into JPEGs that will show you the, the images as history and how it was edited and when AI touched it. 
this type of file structure could also give credit to the thousands or millions of images that were used in the synthesis of a new image. And that type of technology would obviously be able to help artists get the money that they deserve for having influenced a specific output from stable diffusion. And it's, you know, it's not just images. It could go for large language models. Uh, even the actors and screenwriters are kind of calling for this right now. as for sure. are. And uh, it, uh, it is all technically possible. It, it would essentially be like a blockchain that could take record of everything that had trained that model. Right now, it's the Wild West. These models were trained on data that was just scraped from the free internet that we have. Uh, but eventually, you know, I think something will have to change. And that's the technology that I could see happening in the future that might solve that. Yeah, sh shout out to Adam, who also just posted blockchain in the, in the chat. Right. Um, uh, just th this really builds on what we were just talking. Vanessa is asking, you know, this is obviously it's it's a super interesting time to be alive right now. But um, uh, Vanessa's ha Vanessa hasn't heard a lot on what we're doing to safely protect these technologies from bad actors. You know, someone could potentially use AI to copy your voice, pretend to be you for fraudulent uh, purposes. Um, is there a a kind of a a critical or artistic response mm. possible there? Um, I mean, yeah, there's tons of stuff. I don't know if you know this, but on the dark web, there's this thing called Worm GPT that started getting sold like last week. And it's basically Chat GPT, uh, you know, with all of the limits taking off of it, specialized in writing malware and doing all sorts of terrible stuff. I think with any technology, I mean, you can look at nuclear energy. There, once the cat is out of the bag, it's up to us to decide how we're going to use it. Um, I think there are being quick, quite quickly, there are steps that are being taken in order to kind of put some reins on this. Um, I hope that it's not too late. Um, proof of personhood and these embedded uh, file histories are going to go a long way when we're talking about image generation and deep fakes and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, I really hope that proof of personhood becomes a thing that we can like have, uh, it'd be like your passport or whatever, but when you're online and you make something, you could stamp it and people would know like this was made by a person. Maybe even this was made by a specific person uh, and put like a little more onus on the creator to really like, you know, take credit for what they've done. And I don't know, it sounds a bit big brotherish, but uh, there has to be a way to do it. Maybe it's an anonymous, but it, you know, it, you know that it was made by a person or something. This type of tech uh, will will help a lot in that regard. Yeah, and I, I love too what you were saying about you know taking user inputs, and I, and I think there's lots of potential to really sort of use uh, this creative technology to educate the the public on mm -hmm. on what's possible. I think a lot of people don't have a really good idea of exactly how fake a deep fake can be so i think there's right. there's probably some opportunities there definitely um this is a very much a connected question as well i think this will probably be our our last question um jill is saying building on uh, critical thinking and constructive criticism what is the state of ai's ability to evaluate its own output results do you think we'll ever be at the point where the ai will be able to tell you ha how accurate it thinks its output is compared to the initial idea yeah, I mean, you're seeing it right now. That is exactly how Clip works. So uh, uh, there's a, an idea in machine learning where you have supervised learning. Yeah. And that was like all we had for a really long time. And now there's unsupervised learning. And unsupervised learning is like a, a model that is training itself. So even just generating a single image in stable diffusion, it works a lot like the physical process of drawing something from a real person. You hold your pencil up here and you kind of squint your eyes and you imagine an apple and you kind of put a few rough marks on the paper. And when you're squinting, it looks like an apple. And as you open your eyes, it looks less like an apple and you refine it. And then you squint less and you refine it. And eventually you get a picture of an apple. That's exactly what stable diffusion is doing. It's starting with a very blurry picture and it's just changing it randomly. 
And it has a mathematical way of looking at that data and telling it if when it changed it, did it get closer to the apple or further mm -hmm. away? And it does that hundreds of thousands of times until you have a photorealistic apple. And so you're seeing the results of computers being able to do that right now. That's like, that is a core of how it works. It just starts blurry and refines itself against math that can prove whether it's better or worse than what it's referencing. Those references, when it's referencing, are what people should get paid for. When you're right. referencing my Apple, then a fraction of a penny goes into my account or something, you know? Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Um, we're, we're out of time for our Q&A, but um, thank you so much, Patrick. There was, again, it was very dense. I'm definitely going to be watching uh, <laughs> that video uh, uh, back again. So much uh, really, really cool and interesting uh, stuff in there. So thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick. Thank you. It's been my pleasure.